read God's word together. Uh, today's scripture is Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 through 13. We'll be uh, reading first in the NIV. We'll do a responsive reading, which means that I'll read the first verse, and then everyone will respond with the verse after that. We'll keep going back and forth until the end. Um, and uh, it is the NIV, so uh, you can look that up in a pew Bible, or if you... Uh, have a Bible app or happen to have an NIV with you, uh, please follow along. And so please stand as able for the reading of God's Word today. Again, it's Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 through 13. May the Lord bless the reading of God's Word. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, today's message is, uh, uh, I, I think it says the prayer of the Son of God. Um, I, I'll explain why. I tried to change that the last minute, but I think uh, uh, I didn't get that change in enough. But it says the kingdom prayer here. Don't worry about the title too much, but I'll explain the title change in a moment. Um, brothers and sisters, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know, how, how have you been this week? You guys been doing okay? You guys had a good week? Yeah? Well, I think uh, oftentimes when people ask you that question, there's always the obligatory like, oh, uh, you know, how's your week going? Uh, fine, fine. You know, and I think I've given that answer a few times this week when people just ask me in passing. And to be honest, brothers and sisters, that wasn't the absolute truth. Um, and, and I'll be really honest with you. This week has been one of the hardest, if not the hardest week of my life. And so today's message, I just want to warn you, it's going to be a part sermon, part testimony. Um, and hopefully it'll go together well. Uh, we, we will take a couple weeks to go through the Lord's Prayer, so don't worry if it gets a little too into the testimony. But I wanted to share with you a little bit of what I've been going through, but also God's goodness. And uh, so, but yeah, we'll be using the, the Lord's Prayer to, to hear that story. And so the Lord's Prayer is... Uh, uh, probably one of the most famous, if not the most famous prayer in the Bible. Uh, so famous, in fact, that I think a lot of people probably have it memorized. How many people have the Lord's Prayer memorized? Yeah? Okay. A lot of you guys, right? Um, for me, I had it memorized from a young age. Uh, but a funny thing happened is uh, when I was uh, serving as a youth pastor in Maryland, we would pray the Lord's Prayer all the time at the end of the service. And uh, then when I was at St. Matthew's, uh, the church where I was serving side by side for five years, um, that I also would have to repeat or, or say the Lord's Prayer uh, after our congregational prayer. Um, and when I'm not really thinking about it, I can repeat the Lord's Prayer like it's nothing, right? Like it's just off the top of my head. It's just automatic. Um, but a weird thing happened that when I had to pray that prayer in front of people, um, I would kind of like overthink it and I would always mess up. And oftentimes I would mess up at the uh, forgive us our trespasses. Uh, I would either mess up the trespasses or the temptation part. I don't know. Maybe it was just like too many syllables, temptation, you know. Uh, and I would kind of trip over my words. And oftentimes, of course, people are trying to, you know, they're saying it from memory too. But people are kind of like following with me. And so it would always trip everyone up. And it, inevitably, people would like kind of giggle, you know. And just every week, I'm like, what's wrong with you, Steve? What's wrong with you? Like, seriously, you know this prayer. You've prayed it so many times before. And so it, it, it got so bad, in fact, that when I was at St. Matthew's, I would have it written out in front of me, right? Something that I've memorized a million times before, but just in case, right? And so it was like this weird overthinking thing. And I think that for many of us, the Lord's Prayer... Um, it's not something you actually think about. When I wasn't thinking about it, I could just say it automatically. But a weird thing is when I was overthinking it, I actually couldn't come up with the words. You know, and it, there's this weird kind of like, I don't know, this anxiety of being up in front of people that kind of interfered with the words. You know, but I want to tell you, this week, 
I've been praying the Lord's Prayer um, probably more than I've prayed it in a long time. And the funny thing is, is actually, I didn't intend on preaching about the Lord's Prayer today. So some of you may know, we've been going through uh, the Gospel of Matthew, and we've been going in order. And so we had the sermon series, Metanoia, right, which... Uh, it means changing, changing your life, your minds, your direction, you know? And so we've just been going in order, verse by verse by verse. And the Lord's Prayer was up. <laughs> but the funny thing is that, you know, I kind of thought to myself, I was like, you know, it's, be it's the beginning of a new year. You know, maybe I'll, I'll preach a, 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 a series, like a little mini series, just break it up a little bit. You know, people maybe have been, you, you know, I, I don't know, maybe just, just getting a little too, too predictable, just going through Matthew verse by verse by verse. Maybe I'll do a, a three-week sermon series on resolution, right? Like New Year's resolutions and, and how to really, you know, make them stick. And so that's actually what, uh, what I was planning. I was actually reading a book about it. And, um, you know, lo and behold, <laughs> with the week that I've gone through, um, I have learned to pray the Lord's Prayer anew for me in a way where the words are not just wrote anymore. But nor am I overthinking the words. But I've learned to sort of I know this is going to sound like a little weird, maybe a little zen, to kind of be the words, embody the words, if that makes sense. And so I, I want to read the Lord's Prayer with you. Well, actually, let's go over the little introduction that Jesus was talking about, and then I'll try to explain to you why this prayer has meant so much to me, especially this week. So verse 7 uh, this is in, uh, continuing Jesus' teaching on prayer. Uh, before the break, uh, we had talked about how Jesus was telling us to pray in secret so that we weren't praying to impress other people, to go into that secret place, uh, just you and God. Uh, and so continuing in those directions, he says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. Uh, in the NIV, it says, do not babble on as the Gentiles do. Uh, that phrase, uh, to heap up empty phrases, um, uh, that, that, that word in the Greek, it means to kind of re re uh, to repeat things, uh, kind of like mindlessly. And that's why it uses that word babble. But you just kind of repeat the same things over and over and over, and they stop kind of meaning anything. Uh, it says, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. And so... Um, for many ancient people, the way they would pray is they would just keep, you know, uh, bugging the gods, right? They would just keep praying again and again and again. You know, God do this, God do this, God do this, God do this. And it would just be this rote thing again and again and again and again and again. And so, you know, this, this idea that they think they will be heard for their many words. But Jesus is clear. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Brothers and sisters, as we learn to pray the way that Jesus wants to teach us how to pray, I want to uh, just maybe just warn us from be becoming too legalistic about these passages, right? Um, I don't want us to get too hung up with saying like, oh, you know, those people at church, when they pray so much, they use too many words. You know, that's what Jesus is talking about. Um, let, let's not be too judgmental of other people, but I think there are principles that Jesus wants to teach us about prayer. And so we don't want to apply these things too legalistically. You know, he doesn't say never use your own words. Um, but I, I think this idea of thinking that you will be heard because of your many words, right? That's what Jesus wants to address. This idea that there is a God out there that needs to be appeased or convinced, that you use lots of words, like God wasn't going to listen to you, you know, or maybe God couldn't hear you, but you just have to keep shouting to the heavens, God, listen to me, God, help me, God, save me, and you just keep doing it again and again and again, and God's finally like, ah, oh, Okay, what is this little mortal who keeps yelling at me, right? Okay, now I'll pay attention to that, right? And so Jesus is saying, your father already knows what you need before you ask him. You, you, you don't need to get his attention through the repetition of many words, nor do you need to twist his arm. But the thing is, for a lot of the ancient people, and by the way, this may not just be ancient people. This might be us as well that we're not convinced 
that God actually listens to our prayers or that God has good intentions for us. And so maybe we think that with our prayers, you know, we're like, God, can you please do this for me? There's maybe this sense within us, God doesn't want to do those things. God doesn't want good things for us. And we have to convince him. And this is where Jesus is trying to correct this, right? God already knows what you need before you ask him. And what kind of God is this? Well, we will learn this in this prayer. Um, He says, pray like this. And this is what we have come to call the Lord's Prayer. And so, uh, brothers and sisters, a few things I want to say um, about this, uh, that that I always usually say these things when I teach the Lord's Prayer. Um, But one of the things is that I don't think it's meant to just be a form prayer. I think it's great to memorize it. Uh, but I think that it, one of the things that I've been learning this week is the freedom to still pray the Lord's Prayer, but to change the words a little bit. Um, because, you know, one of the things you've, you've noticed is that we're not reading it in the original Greek, right? You're reading a translation. And so one of the things you may have noticed is that some of the words that, that we just read uh, in the NIV are maybe different than the way that you've learned to pray the Lord's Prayer, right? And I'm going to read it now in the ESV, and you'll still hear a little different interpretation of it, right? Um, and so, you know, one of the things that, that comes up a lot is forgive us our, in the ESV it's going to say debts, but maybe you have said temp, uh, our, uh, what is it? Our trespasses, thank you. Our trespasses, there I go again. <laughs> or uh, maybe you've heard forgives our sins, right? And so, you know, we have these different ways of saying it. And so I don't want you to get caught up with the exact words. It's about the heart. It is about the underlying meaning of things, right? So this is not meant to be a form prayer. But brothers and sisters, I think what the Lord's Prayer is about is not to say only pray this prayer, no other prayers, but this is a prayer that is meant to align us to the heart of God. It is meant to align us to the kingdom of God, right? Because another thing that you have to ask is, why do we need to pray this prayer? Because Jesus just said, he already knows what you need before you ask him. So why do we need to pray a prayer if Jesus, if God already knows what you need, right? Maybe some of you have wondered that. You know, is it weird to pray when God already knows what you need? Shouldn't we just say like, you know, shouldn't we just be like, okay, you know God, (laughs) amen, you know? But I think there is something in this prayer that is meant for us, not just for God. It is meant for you to align to the hearts of God, to the kingdom of God, right? And that's what this prayer is really about. Right. And so it says that pray then like this, our father in heaven. And this is why I I wanted to change the sermon title. We often call it the Lord's prayer, right? Meaning Jesus's prayer. Right. And then I, I titled the sermon at first, the prayer of the son of God. And the reason why I wanted to change the title is because not all of you are males, right? Not all of you are boys. Right? And I didn't want you to think that this is just Jesus' prayer. How do I know this? Because in the first line it says, Our Father. Right? This isn't just Jesus' prayer. This is your prayer. Right? So then I thought about calling it uh, the prayer of the children of God. And I was like, oh, this is getting a little bulky. So I was just like, okay, kingdom prayer. <laughs> but brothers and sisters, the point is that this is a prayer we are all supposed to pray And so when it says, our father, it's not just Jesus' father. He's your father too, right? Um, I've mentioned this before too in teaching the Lord's Prayer, that uh, uh, calling God father was not common uh, for uh, the people of Israel. Um, they, They would use father like kind of as a metaphor, but very rarely would you call God Father. That would be like almost like borderline blasphemous because it would be like too casual. How dare you call God, you know, such a, a familial term. God is so much bigger, right? God is so far above you that the people of Israel, whenever they would see the holy name of God, they wouldn't even pronounce it. They wouldn't even say it out loud. That was the kind of reverence they had for God. So to compare God to your earthly father would have been a, a little like, like, yeah, no, you don't do that, right? 
But this is how Jesus would pray. And we know that Jesus had this very intimate way of praying to God. He would call him Abba, right? Daddy. You know, and that intimacy that Jesus had was very special. But Jesus, in this prayer, is trying to extend that intimacy to you. Yes, you are a child. And you can pray with that kind of closeness, that, that familial closeness with God. Where you don't have to fear God, like God is this on high where he's going to zap you and destroy you. Yes, there is this thing about the fear of God, about this respect of God. But this kind of like, oh my gosh, God, you know, I, I, I sinned and I screwed up and now I'm going to get it. That's the way the people of Israel thought. That's not the way Jesus thought. Jesus had a real closeness with God. And this is what uh, Jesus wanted to extend to all of us. Remember, this is a part of the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is about the availability of the kingdom. We started the Sermon on the Mount with Jesus talking to the poor, the poor in spirit, the people who didn't know anything about religion, the people who had screwed up religion, right? The people who had been meek, the people who had no voice, the people who had been persecuted, the people who had been stomped on, the people who, everyone who would have been thought of as powerful and rich and worth something would have looked at them and looked down on them and said, Jesus, why are you wasting your time with these people? And this is who Jesus is talking to. And he was saying, you are blessed. The kingdom of God is available to you. And in this prayer, that becomes abundantly clear. We are praying to our Father. Our Father, remember, God already knows what you need. And, and fathers, uh, especially this good Father, wants to give good things to you, has good purposes for you. And that is what is implied by saying, our Father in heaven. Can you see, brothers and sisters, why this is going to take two weeks for us to go through this prayer, right? That, that these words are packed with meaning. But remember, it is not just any father. It is the father in the heavens, in every plane of existence, including the heaven where God resides, you know, wherever that is, right? That this is not your earthly father. This is a heavenly father. So maybe some of us have some backward issues of fathers, but if that's the case, brothers and sisters, we have this opportunity to be reparented. And all of us, we need that. You need that, right? And so uh, I, I was reading this uh, book this past week. Uh, it's called Tattoos, uh, Tattoos on the Heart. Um, it was written by uh, Greg Boyle, who's a, a Jesuit priest who works in uh, Southern California in one of the worst neighborhoods in LA that has uh, the most gang violence and the most proliferation of gangs uh, in any zip code in the United States. And so he works mostly in these with these Latino gangsters. And one of the things that Greg Boyle said is that um, almost a lot of uh, the gangsters that he meets uh, many of them don't really have fathers. Or if they do have fathers, their fathers have been really terrible. And it's just this, this perpetual cycle, right? That bad fathers make bad fathers make bad fathers, right? And that uh, he was sharing the story where he was visiting this jail, and there's all these incarcerated people. And he's like, these jails are just full of people who have no fathers or, or bad fathers. And so one of the guys he was meeting with was this uh, young uh, gang member, and, uh, you know, he was just trying to make conversation with him. And he was like, hey, um, you know, can you tell me about your father? And he got real quiet. And he was like, ah, my father wasn't really around a lot. Um, you, you know, he was like, like on drugs most of the time. Uh, but, you know, the few times that he was around, I kind of wished he wasn't. And there was this one memory he had when he was 14 years old, ninth grader, right? Maybe some of you guys are 14, um, that his father uh, happened to be home, and he got in some trouble at school. And um, that uh, when, when he got home from school, um, his father asked him, like, what happened? Right? I heard you got in trouble at school. And he was like, uh, I don't want to tell you that. He's like, why not? T tell me, kid. You know, tell me, boy, what would you, you do? And he was like, Okay, Dad, I'll tell you, but you have to promise not to, not to hit me. And so his, his dad like, was kind of like taken aback. He was like, son, I love you. Right? You can tell me anything. I won't hit you. 
And so he's like, okay. So he told them what he did. And then he's telling this story to this Jesuit priest. And he gets real quiet. And then he starts trembling and crying. He says, Father, you know what happened next? He beat me with a pipe. And it's this sort of not having a father, not feeling safe for a lot of people. You know, we just look at people like that. We're like, oh, man, those people are bad. You know, they're just wrong. They just need to stop, you know, doing these bad things. But brothers and sisters, for many of us, I think these, you know, even if you have good parents, I think there are many ways where we get broken by life. And so uh, for, for this young man, uh, he was talking to this Jesuit priest, and you know, over the course of their relationship, as they got closer, one of the things he said to him is, he said, um, it, it, so he called him G, because his name was, was Greg, Father Greg, and so like everyone just calls him G. They're like, what up, G, right? And so he's like, G, can I ask you something? He said, yeah, sure. He was like, um, you know, I, I told you about my dad. You know, we had this horrible relationship. And honestly, I've come to think of you as my father more than my earthly dad. And he was like, do you think of me? Um, do, you, do you think of yourself as my father? And, and you know, G, Father Craig, he, he says, yeah, of course. And then he gets real quiet again. And then he's, his voice is trembling and he's crying. And he's like, and I also think of myself as your son. Do you think of me as your son? He says, of course, of course. And what was going on in that was this, this very important healing in this, this young man's life for him to know that he could be loved like a son. He was lovable, right? When we pray, our Father, we are praying not just that God is our Father, but we are his sons and daughters, all of us. That's why it's our Father, right? And so this Father loves you and will defend you and wants good things for you. And we pray for this, this Father. We, we bless his name. Holy be your name. That's what hallowed means, right? Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And brothers and sisters, this is one of those things. God is a good God who loves you. He is your father. And when you are praying for God's will, you are praying a, a, a surrender by saying, your kingdom come, your will be done. You are simultaneously praying, my kingdom needs to go away. My will needs to take subservience to your will. But praying that to your Father who has good things for you means that you trust that God has good things for you. Now, for many of us, this is a, a difficult thing for us because many of us feel like we are not living in God's will. But I want to say something to you that maybe you don't fully believe, but I'm going to say it anyways. And maybe you'll start to believe it a little bit. I believe that even if you are not living in God's will, even if you're sinning, if you are making mistakes, if you're screwing up every day, you are not thwarting the will of God. I'm going to say that again. Even if you are not fully living in the will of God, that you are not thwarting the will of God. Right? God can still work in you. And that for me, this has been very important this week. Um, I've been going through some things that, you know, I wasn't really sure, like, God, is this your will? Why would you want this for me? And maybe some of you, you go through things as well, where you're like, God, why would you want this for me? You know, and maybe that wasn't God's will, but those things happening in your life are not thwarting the will of God. God is still your father, and he still loves you, and he can still take care of you in those things that you are going through. Uh, what, uh, last week, uh, I wasn't here because I was in Cincinnati, and uh, I, I went to visit my parents in Cincinnati, uh, but at the same time, I was asked to speak at a retreat. 
um, it was a youth retreat for uh, my parents' church and uh, another church, these two churches t together for their youth. And I actually want to show you a picture of uh, this retreat that I went to speak at. Uh, so it was about, 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 it was like 40, 50 people there, I think. Um, it wasn't a huge retreat. Uh, there I am in the middle. You, you know, whenever you, you, you do these pictures, there's always like the serious picture. There's a picture where everyone smiles, and then there's a the silly picture. This is the silly picture. Um, and so it was a wonderful time, brothers and sisters. But one of the things that started to happen while I was in Cincinnati, because I would uh, travel back and forth. During the day, I would hang out with my family. And in the evening, I would go to speak at this retreat. And I would come back at night um, and sleep at my home. But a lot of times, I'd be amped up from the retreat. Um, and I was sleeping on the couch. And I couldn't sleep very well. Um, and the last night, the retreat was wonderful. Um, it was such a blessing. And at, 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 during the prayer time, uh, I, I asked people, is there anyone who would like me to pray for them? I do this at every retreat I speak at. And usually, like, maybe like three, maybe four kids come up. But at this retreat, I don't know how many kids came up, but I was praying for kids for over two hours. Like, like maybe like two and a half hours. So as you can see, it's not a big retreat. So I prayed for most of the people that you see in this picture, right? And I was laying hands on them, and it was a, a, a wonderful blessing. They were sharing so many things in their lives. Uh, they, they were going through a lot of stuff. You know, some, some of those kids were you know, very depressed or you know, had very poor self-images. Um, uh, some of them were dealing with a lot of guilt and shame. Some of those kids were very anxious. And I was laying hands on them and praying for them. And that night, instead of going home, I slept at the retreat because the next day I was going to give the final message. And that night, I tossed and turned, and I couldn't sleep. Didn't think anything of it. And you know, maybe for the first time uh, in months, um, on Sunday, because we were so busy, we went to church, and we had to get all this stuff packed up, and we came back to, to Ann Arbor, um, I didn't get a chance to pray as I normally do. And so um, that night was okay. Next day was New Year's Eve. And on New Year's Eve night, something kind of strange happened. Uh, I was uh, trying to go to sleep. And you know, the ball dropped. And yay, Happy New Year is great, right? We're going to have a great 2019. But that night, um, as I was trying to go to bed, I, I was very congested and I couldn't breathe. And this, this thought just got a hold of me. This thought like, oh my gosh, I can't breathe. Maybe there's something like wrong with my breathing. Like, oh, this isn't good. And that thought like kind of just got a hold of me. And that whole night I couldn't sleep until about six o'clock in the morning. Next day, um, you know, it's fine. But the next night, so New Year's Day, same thing happens. I can't sleep again. You know, same thing. I get congested. I feel like I can't breathe. But this time I'm like really kind of starting to get hung up on my breathing. And so I don't go to sleep until about 5.45, wake up the next day, and I'm exhausted. Um, but that day, I was staying home with, uh, with my kids. And uh, you know, when, when I wake up and I finally come down, it's like 10.45. They're like, Dad, let's play Super Smash Brothers. <laughs> and I was like, hey, kids, um, I will in a moment, but I, I, just, I just need to go pray. And I did, and things got better. And I started to feel better. I was like, oh, OK, like, I'm feeling normal. This is great. Whole day, like, I'm starting, like, my mood's starting to pick up. But still in the back of my mind, I was like, hmm, I just feel like I can't breathe super well. But it's OK. It's OK. Don't think about it. And so like, like you know, we go out. I'm like, OK, because all of New Year's Day, we stayed at home. And I'm like, OK, maybe that's not helping. You know, we were staying at home. I need some fresh air. We all need fresh air. So I was like, kids, we're going out. right? So we went out. And while we're out, I was like, hey, what do you guys want to do for dinner? And they were like, my kids in unison were like, Texas Roadhouse. I was like, yeah, let's go to Texas Roadhouse. Yeah. And so you know, we decided to go to Texas Roadhouse. You know, And, and things are looking up and up. And I get into Texas Roadhouse, and we get into our booth, and it's very crowded in the restaurant. It's very stuffy in there. And when I sit in the booth, I start getting this, just this panic over me. And I was like, oh, I, I, I can't be here. And, and, and you know, I told my family, I was like, hey, guys, I'm really sorry. I need to go outside. 
And I went outside, I was all panicky. And, and all of a sudden, I felt like I couldn't breathe again. And I was starting to get dizzy and lightheaded. And I was trying to walk around and pray outside. If you guys have been to Texas Roadhouse, they have that, that fountain outside, and there's no water running, but I was just walking around the fountain. I think people are like, what is that Asian kid doing? You know, I, I think people think I look like a kid. But you know, I'm just like pacing around this fountain. And you know, eventually, I come in, and I seriously can't eat. This is weird, man. I had like a 16 ounce ribeye, medium rare in front of me. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, it's marbled perfectly and I couldn't eat a bite of it. I was like forcing myself to eat because I'm like, oh, it's a 16 ounce ribeye. This is awesome. But I was like, uh, and I started to wonder, is there something really physically wrong with me? And I told Aaron, I was like, hey, maybe I need to go to, you know, see someone and go to urgent care. I, I feel like I actually can't breathe. You know, but after a while, I started to kind of calm down. I was like, okay, maybe this is in my head. And that night, I was like, okay, you know what the problem is? Is I haven't slept the last two nights. I was like, tonight, I'm going to sleep. All right, this is my mission. I'm going to sleep. And so Erin was awesome. She went to, to Meyer and bought like every like decongestant, every cold medicine, everything you could think of. She brought this huge bag home. I think spent like $200 on meds and was like, okay, you know, and, and I, I like elevated my head. I was like on, on this comfortable couch, like was nestled in a blanket, humidifiers going. I had like breathe right strips over my nose. And, you know, and, and I put like headphones in and I'm listening to like, like, like meditations for sleep, right? I'm like, I'm going to sleep tonight. And that night I did sleep, <laughs> but I kept waking up. And about six o'clock in the morning, I wake up, it's super cold. I go upstairs, sleep in my bed and I wake up. And as soon as I wake up, I'm super anxious and it starts all over again. And I feel like I can't breathe. And that day, actually, someone was coming in from out of town and was like, hey, Pastor Steve, do you want to get a bite to eat? And I was like, no, I don't want to eat anything. I just want to figure out why I can't breathe. And brothers and sisters, over this period of time, okay, this, this may not mean anything to you, but for me, this is kind of a big deal. Not only was I eating, I wasn't watching any Netflix or playing any video games. <laughs> I normally do a lot of that. But all I was focusing on was like, oh my gosh, I can't breathe. You know, I mean, just every moment felt like agony. And, and so that, that morning before I went to meet this guy for, for lunch, I made an appointment to go see the doctor. The whole lunch, I was just super distracted. Again, forcing myself to eat. We went to Poke Bowl. I love Poke Bowl. Oh my gosh, sushi, right? And I'm, I'm eating the sushi and it, it, I, I can barely eat it. And I go to see the, the doctor and as I'm, talking to the doctor, I'm getting super anxious. And while I'm talking to him, I'm short of breath. I can't talk to him because I'm just like, like really, really out of breath. And, um, you know, while the doctor is talking to me, he keeps like asking me questions like, oh, so you're a pastor. Where's your church? I'm like, man, I know what you're trying to do. You're like trying to distract me, you know, but come on, man, just treat me. Okay. Tell me what's wrong. And so, so he did all these tests and he found that I was getting enough oxygen to my blood. Um, I was able to get a full breath. He, they took a chest x-ray just to make sure. And he was like, Steve, to be honest, I think your breathing is fine. But I think what's happening is somehow this anxiety is sort of feeding on itself. And so you're feeling anxious about breathing and that's making you more anxious and so you're getting lightheaded and, you know, you, you, your, your breath is getting shorter and that makes you more anxious, right? And then that makes the breathing harder and then that makes you more anxious, right? And it's just feeding on itself, right? And so, you know, by the way, friends, <laughs> this is one of the things is when I pray and when I try to calm myself down, this is, you guys know when people are treating anxiety, what is the first thing they tell you to do? The first thing, very first thing, every single person, I promise you, you look it up and they tell you, if you're dealing with anxiety, the number one thing they tell you is what? Focus on your breath. And that's the thing making me anxious, right? So I'm like, oh, great, right? And so I, I was in that doctor's office and I was like, I was like, oh my gosh, he's not going to tell me what's wrong with me. But at the same time, I was like, okay, 
This is anxiety. This is not physical. I can actually get a good breath. And that actually kind of weirdly calmed me. Uh, we went out to eat with some friends <laughs> that night, and I started getting anxious again. Uh, and that night, um, the doctor prescribed for me uh, uh, anti-anxiety med. And I took one, and it, it calmed me down. And it wasn't super strong, but it was enough to just kind of calm me down. And um, the next day, though, same, that, that nervousness, that anxiousness came up. And so, brothers and sisters, what broke me out of the cycle is kind of the opposite of what you normally think. And by the way, um, th that, that day when I went to see the doctor, um, I called one of my really good friends, Pastor Sam Choi. Um, he's come to speak for us a few times. And um, Pastor Sam is, is uh, very spiritually attuned. And I was explaining to him the whole story, the same thing I explained to you. When I was talking about the retreat, he was like, Steve, can I ask you a question? Did you lay hands on these kids at the retreat? I was like, yeah. He's like, because the timing of all this seems very funny. And as you were sharing with me, I couldn't help but think that there was a time a couple years ago, I went to speak at a retreat. And after that retreat, um, I was starting to get depressed and anxious and all these things that I hadn't dealt with in years. And I actually asked a pastor friend to pray for me, and he told me that sometimes when you go to these retreats and you're praying for, for people, and those people are getting free, right? You know, the, those whatever spirits are, are coming off them, that sometimes those latch on to the person who are praying for them. You know, he's like, Pastor Steve, I don't know, but maybe that's what happened to you. You know, and so um, my, my friend Sam was praying to kind of cut off those spirits you know, whatever those were. And I spent a lot of time the past couple of days exercising myself, you know, be gone in the name of Jesus, be gone, you know. But brothers and sisters, this is one of the things that I, um, that has really helped me more than anything, was learning to pray the Lord's Prayer again. And not just the Lord's Prayer, but do you guys know Romans 12, one through two? I know I've preached on it many times before, and it's a very famous uh, uh, scripture passage. It is um, uh, that, brothers and sisters, I urge you in view of God's mercy to present your bodies to God as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. We think all of the things that we do are spiritual, right? You know, fighting demons and all of that. But what I have learned to do over the last few days is to present my body, my lack of breath, all of these things before God and be still. He is my father, right? And one of the things in that prayer, let's go back to the Lord's Prayer for a moment, that give us this day our daily bread. Remember I told you, you kind of, kind of, can kind of riff off those things, maybe change the words around a little bit. What this means is give us enough bread for the next day. That's it. Not enough bread for your entire life, but this means that you are praying this prayer with regularity, right? Because we must depend on God every single day. Right? Over the next 24 hours, God, give me all that I need. Bread, it's one of the most basic things. And for me, I mean, you only need to change a couple words, but I've been praying, give me this day my daily breath. My daily breath. And praying this prayer in the confidence of knowing that I'm going to have enough breath. I've talked about anxiety before. I can tell you why you go through it. If any of you are ever dealing with anxiety, I really encourage you to get some help for it. It's, it's really a horrible thing. I'd be happy to talk to you. I'm not a medical professional. I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist or a counselor. Those people can be very helpful. Um, but one of the things that I know for me is that when I'm feeling anxious, what it is about is feeling like there's a threat, right? It's fear, like, like I became afraid of my own breath. Maybe there's some spiritual component from that retreat. Maybe somehow my breath, that, that lack of breath got associated with sleeplessness, 
And my mind made that connection. It was like, oh my gosh, you can't sleep because you can't breathe. And then every time I couldn't breathe, my body's like, okay, danger, danger, danger. And every moment, I mean, I can't eat. I can't sleep. I can't think of anything, but I can't breathe. And then the more I think about it, the more I can't breathe, right? And it was just driving me crazy. It felt like agony. And one of these things, instead of distracting myself, because this is what most of us do, you know, and by the way, brothers and sisters, as I've been healing this week, one of the things I noticed is that even without this big anxiety, I noticed there's these little anxieties in my life that just kind of go unnoticed. And, and what I think is there are a lot of us who are walking around with anxieties and fears and depression and just not being okay in our own skin, right? We don't you know, the, the give us this day our daily bread. Give us everything we need over the, t- the next 24 hours. Many of us, were like, you know what, Jesus, you know, God, don't worry about give us today our daily bread. I'm going to go get my daily bread. I'm going to go get my daily satisfaction. I'm going to go get the things to make me feel better. And we run and we chase it. And when we're standing still, when we're being still, I think this is one of the reasons why We are so bad at being still and silent before God. I've shared this before, but when I tried to teach this a couple years ago, uh, we did a time of uh, 10 minutes of silent prayer. And seriously, I've never seen so many people at the same time get up to go to the bathroom, right? Because I think we do not know how to be still. It makes us anxious. So we're like, we have to move. We have to move. Present your body as a living sacrifice. Don't move. Be still in this moment. And when I felt like I couldn't breathe, instead of resisting it, instead of believing it, don't believe those lies. Don't become your lack of breath. Right? I I didn't quite believe it, but I felt it. Right? I just held that before God and I didn't move. I was like, okay, God, I'm feeling this. But I also know that I am your child. And I just sat still as a child to my heavenly father who could take care of my daily breath. And I've been praying that prayer. And I've been taking these moments. Sometimes I put my kids to bed and I normally pray in this way, but it's become almost life or death for me, right? Praying in this way. In the morning, I try to pray this way all the time. But this is something that I've really had to do the last few days. And it has been getting better. And I have been getting more free and clear in my breath. Praise God. You know, and brothers and sisters, this is not ultimately about me. But I want to ask you, what are you anxious about? What is worrying you? What is keeping you from being still? What is is causing you to chase and run after these things, whatever things in your life? Oh my gosh, I need to go on my phone. Oh my gosh, I need to take a nap. Oh my gosh, I need to medicate myself. You know, one of the days when I went to get some more meds because I was been stocking up on like all these decongestants and things like that. You know, I was walking around Meyer and I was just looking at people. And so many people that I look at, I mean, I don't know what's going on with them. I don't know their whole stories. But when I look at people, I don't see a lot of peace in people. I see a lot of very distracted people. I see a lot of things in their shopping carts to self-medicate. Again, no judgment, no judgment at all, right? But I see in a lot of people, people who cannot be still in this moment and know that it is profoundly okay because they have a Heavenly Father who is with them now. And they have everything they need. And maybe that's you. Maybe you think you need to chase something, chase a grade, chase a significant other, (laughs) chase a relationship status, chase money, chase some experience, right? Chase some inner peace or whatever the case may be, physical health, appearance. Brothers and sisters, in this moment, you are God's child and you can have everything you need in this moment. Don't get me wrong, it doesn't mean those things can't change later, but it doesn't change your primary status as a child of God. We are gonna go into communion, but I wanna just do something in this moment. 
And by the way, when you're really amped up in your anxiety, fear, depression, whatever you're going through, it's really hard to do this. But the fact that you guys are here are telling me that probably you're not in that moment. <laughs> but for many of us, we just have this low level of anxiety running all the time, and we don't know how to be present. And still, in those moments, so when the stuff really ramps up, oh my gosh, you really can't be still then. So we got to practice, right? So I want you to practice with me. Maybe you're like, but Pastor Steve, I'm like actually doing kind of okay. That's okay. That's okay. Then just be still. Just enjoy the stillness, okay? But I want to encourage you right now. So you can take a deep breath. Hopefully that doesn't make you anxious. <laughs> it's normally very calming. Let's take a deep breath in through your nose. Out through your mouth. In through your nose. Out through your mouth. In through your nose. Out through your mouth. One more time. In through your nose. Out through your mouth. And in this moment of stillness, brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question. Don't think too much. Right? Anxiety and fear and depression, you guys know where it comes from, right? It comes from your mind. And our minds, we think, are so indispensable. And they're important, don't get me wrong. But more important than your mind is your actual being, is you. You are not your mind. Your mind's a part of you. <laughs> You're not part of your mind. It should be subservient to you. And so for many of us that feel like we can't shut off these nervous, anxious thoughts, we need to bring those things in subservience to God, bring those things in submission to the will of God. So don't overthink it, brothers and sisters. But just in this moment, I want to ask you, what is bothering you? Is there anything? And one of the things that I've learned is that your thoughts and emotions are linked. Your emotions are your thoughts playing themselves out in your body, right? So when you think like, oh man, that guy's a big jerk, right? That the more you think about that, you get angry, right? And so oftentimes you can trick yourself into thinking you're not thinking something, but you can't trick your emotions oftentimes. So if you're not sure between your thought and your emotion, listen to the emotion. The emotion is probably true. So sometimes, you know, it's manifesting itself in a headache or stomach pain or just jitteriness. You're just feeling nervous. I'm not asking you to understand it. I'm not asking you to diagnose and to try to figure it out. I'm just asking you to identify it, okay? So is there any emotion, any jitteriness, any physical discomfort within you that you are not comfortable with? Is there anything like that? I want you right now, without judgment, without fighting it, without being like, this sucks or I don't like this, just identify it. Just watch it, okay? You're just going to present it before God. Right? Just watch it with no judgment. It is what it is, right? Just, just watch it without feeding it or becoming it. Just watch that pain, that discomfort, okay? And just hold that before God. And brothers and sisters, as you do, let, let's just take a few minutes. Just hold that pain, that discomfort, that nervous energy, those emotions. I can hear some people shuffling, that's okay. Just own that, you know, just recognize it. I'm restless, I'm restless right now. It's hard for me to sit still. That's okay, no judgment. Do not judge it, do not fight it. Just acknowledge it. And in this moment, just be still and know you are a child of God. If you don't know what that means, just be still <laughs> and know that you are okay in this moment. It's okay. God is with you. God is with you. It's okay. Hold those two things together for a moment. Whatever discomfort you have, without judgment, without fighting, and that in this moment, your heavenly Father is here. You are a beloved child. 
You can have your daily bread, your daily breath, all that you need. It is profoundly okay. And brothers and sisters, I want to invite you to pray the Lord's Prayer with me. And, and it's here, but we will just end with your king, the lead us not into te- temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the power of the kingdom and the glory forever. So let's pray this together. And let's pray it very slowly. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power, the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and